sure get him covered. <laughs> with this song. Amen. It's great to be with you this morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Lynn Cook, and I'm the Senior Director of Spiritual Formation and Care at Redeemer Eastside. We are so glad to be with you today. Everything that you need for this worship service can be found on the screens in front of you. And if you're joining with us online, they're also found on the screens there. So if you also need a full worship guide that's easy to follow along, you can also use the Redeemer app. Um, that where there's a convenient worship guide there. And now for all of us, let's start off with a thought. So for many years, uh, I didn't wear glasses, even though I could have. My two eyes could compensate for each other. But eventually, I got a prescription, and the very first time I put those glasses on, it was like the world all of a sudden went into 3D. I was walking down the street. People felt like they were jumping out at me like I was in a Marvel movie. Um, I could barely walk down the, the, uh, the curbs uh, because my eyes had compensated, but what they'd done was they'd flattened reality. It was flat. And I needed glasses to help me see the world the way it really is. Well, worship is a little bit like putting on glasses. In worship, we actually have the opportunity to see life the way it really is, to see God as above and full of splendor and the one we were created to enjoy, to see ourselves for who we are, ones that have been loved by God infinitely, and to see others as people that we were made to uh, embody Christ to and to love for their good. Worship helps us put on new glasses to see life as it really is. So will you join me? 
Will you stand and let's read today's call to worship from Psalm 113. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Please pray with me. We thank you, Lord, that you have set eternity on our hearts so that no earthly thing can satisfy us wholly. It is so good that there's nothing in this life that can even compare to you. And we acknowledge that our cravings, our restlessness, our striving, even our apathy comes from a longing for you, for you alone can satisfy. Every day as the sun rises, we praise you for your brilliance, extravagance, and your faithfulness. And as the sun sets, we praise you for your care, your sufficiency, and your beauty. There is no one besides you who opens the door to a life of beauty and abundance. And so we crown you as the Lord of all of life, and we crown you as the Lord of our lives. We lift up our voices and we lift up our imagination to say that you are the one we desire. You are the one we adore. You alone. And so in our worship today, we do not want to obscure your splendor in one iota, but we want to make it more plainly see to the eyes of all of us here and to all of our fellow men and women. In these things, we ask of you in Jesus' name. Amen. And because he is so majestic, 
Words can't encompass all of him, so take this time now in silence to praise him. And now we pray together, as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. As you start to get seated, move into the center aisles to make room for those who are still arriving. Thank you so much. Having praised God 
you might realize not all of our life are lived in praise to him. In fact, oftentimes we're living in direct opposition to, to God and his ways. And so as we come to the time of confession, let's pray this prayer together, which will give us a glimpse of the way that God sees things. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us so that we love and serve you in all that we do. Amen. And so take one phrase that struck you as we just prayed together and use this time in silence now for your own private confession. But for all those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hear these words of assurance of pardon from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Please stand for the song of renewal.
is our God. Just the people sing how great. are super excited. You may be seated. We are super excited today uh, to welcome new members into our church family. So at this time, I'd like to invite those joining us uh, to join, us, join me on the stage. <clears throat> Before I introduce them to you all, I'd like to take a moment to explain what membership is. The Bible uses uh, different metaphors for uh, membership in the local church body or to the local church body. It calls it a temple, a family, a body. As a temple, a building, each person is a stone, a brick, building others up and being built up by others. As a body, each one of us is a cell and has a significant role in the health of the body and also in its growth and a particular role in the body vision, seeing, tasting, smelling, uh, etc. And as a family, we seek to love and are committed to each other. And there's a particular code, uh, a family code that shapes how we relate to one another. In membership, these spiritual realities express themselves tangibly. And by making a public promise, we unite ourselves to a particular body of believers, this particular body of believers, Redeemer East Side. And that's why membership in a church is not like membership in a, in a social club or a gym. Uh, membership in those organizations uh, are more consumeristic. Uh, those organizations exist for, uh, to, uh, to provide a service for the members. In the church, it's not quite so. Membership in the church means ministry and service and love in action towards others. And so it really means leaning in and joining in with God in being a blessing for others. At Redeemer East Side, we take seriously that we are a church not for ourselves, but for the good of others, for the good of our city. So there are five steps in the membership process. Step one and two involve taking a class, taking classes, intro to spiritual formation and intro to Redeemer East Side. In these classes, you learn about the history and vision of Redeemer East Side and you'll acquaint yourself with its ministries and opportunities to serve. And then you'll deepen your understanding of the spiritual practices that form us and that help us grow closer in our relationship with God. Step three is an application. Step four, there's an interview where you get to ask questions and we get to know you on a deeper level. And step five, you take your membership vows. And if you haven't been baptized, you would get baptized then. So this is the culmination of this process, and these brothers and sisters are taking uh, their vows today before us, the congregation. And so now let me introduce them to you, and, and then I will give them a brief charge, and then they will take their vows. Uh, first, we have Nick Moy and his wife Liz Pavlov, Elizabeth. Uh, Nick was born in Queens and raised in Long Island, and he grew up going to church and singing in the choir. Liz introduced them to Redeemer when the couple first started, met in 2007, and they attended regularly ever since. Nick is a civil court judge in Manhattan, from Manhattan and is currently presiding in the Brooklyn Civil Court. Liz was also born in, and raised in Queens. Queens people. Uh, Liz's father was a minister in the church where she grew up, where she developed a love and faith for Christ, which sustained her through difficult times, including the loss of her father to cancer. 
Liz graduated from Bernard College and works in the financial services industries. They both met in 2007, became engaged in 2008, and married in 2009. Great track record. They, they're, they've hosted CGs, they've been involved in uh, commu um, children's ministry, and they have a beautiful six-year-old daughter named Olivia. Welcome. Nathan Whitmer, Nate, as we call you, and uh, Katie Finelli of Catherine. Uh, Nate live, has lived in New York for eight years and in East Harlem for two years. They are engaged, and I had the privilege of doing their premarital counseling. Uh, they're connected in a community group, and they're, lo they, they're, they're loving um, going in their connections with the people there. And Nate works in TV production and served as an ar Army officer for four years after college, and he enjoys board games and Phillies baseball. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> Um, Katie, uh, Katie, after the COVID shutdown, uh, Katie and Nate began watching the Questioning Christianity series. This is when Katie, be Katie began to feel connected to Jesus and eventually became a believer. She, is, she manages one of the top bridal salons in New York City, so of course, she will be wearing a fabulous gown for, the, for her wedding this spring. A fun fact about Katie, she's related to a famous Western outlaw, John Wesley Hardin. Interesting. Let me give you a brief charge. As I mentioned before, the Bible describes the church as a body. And Paul, in Romans 12, he says that, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then he gives a list of the different gifts, service, generosity, mercy, etc. What Paul is saying here is that you guys matter and you guys are important. Uh, God has given you gifts. He calls it grace. He has given you graces. And this body of believers needs those graces. Uh, it is encouraging to hear that you've already been putting them into practice. And I encourage you to fan into flame those gifts that God has given to you. They're needed here. Also, in the same passage, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And what that means is that along with the encouragement to use the gifts that God has given to you is the call to live lives that are holy, lives dedicated to Jesus. You see, a great, as great as important it is, as it is to use our gifts, uh, from God's point of view, it is our devotion to Him that matters the most. Our devotion to Him in everything we think, say, and do. That's what living holy lives means. So how do we pursue holy lives? By following rules, obviously. No, just kidding. <laughs> Paul tells us. Paul tells us how we do this. He says, by the mercies of God towards us, having them in mind always. The gospel that He gave His Son for you, that he loved you like no one else has ever loved you. And because of this, now go and live life, a life of love in this community. Love as you have been loved. When this happens and we, when we put our gifts into action and when we all do this together, it creates an environment of healing and grace and, and commitment. And that is what we want. We want... Um, us to be, Redeemer East Side, to be that kind of community, and you're a very important part of it. So let's do that. And now, let's take our vows. Are you ready? Okay. Do you acknowledge yourself to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure with, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? I do. Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? I do. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to promote its purity and peace? I do. Okay, amen. Would you please stand? 
and join me as I pray for these new members and for us as a community. Father, we thank you for bringing these brothers and sisters, these beautiful brothers and sisters into our community, into, into our family, Lord. Father, we thank you for the gift of community where we can grow with each other um, in our relationship with you and with one another, Lord. Thank you that in your community you give us the blessing to serve and to be served, to love and to be loved, and that you have given us gifts and that you love it when we put it, them to action. Father, would you please help us all to do that, to live for you and to put the gifts that you have given us into action. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please join me in welcoming these brothers and sisters into our community? And as we do that, Lynn will come up and lead us in the peace of Christ. For Christ himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down his, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to all who were near. This is the good news. In Christ we are healed, restored, forgiven. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. For our elementary age school children, we're so glad that you're here with us. And now it's time to go to your classes. So please put on your masks and meet your fantastic teachers right in the back of the room. For those of you who might have a little one with you, if they get a little bit uh, restless or wiggly or need a change, please go to the cry room on the fifth floor. You can find it by going out to the lobby and going up the, uh, the elevator to the fifth floor. And for all of us, Having received the peace of Christ, let's pass it to each other. I'll give you a few minutes to greet, and I'll be back with some announcements. If you haven't taken your seat yet and you have any space to move um, toward the center, please do because people are still coming in and it makes it easy for them to sit down. Thanks, everybody. Welcome again to our worship service. Like I said, my name is Lynn Cook. We are so grateful to be here worshiping with you today. If you're here for the first time or you're new in general, we want to extend to you an especially warm welcome. And I would love to point out to you that if you're here in person, there is an info hub table that all newcomers, we'd love to greet you personally. And it's right outside of the lobby as you exit. It's the orange covered table and there'll be people there who can answer your questions, help you get plugged into community and even learn more how to serve the city. So please head to the info hub afterward. We also have a small gift there for you. If you are joining us online, there are volunteers in the chat, so please uh, connect with them, and we'd love to as well connect you more to the larger community of Redeemer Eastside. I'm going to highlight a couple announcements that you want to make note of for the coming weeks. First of all, this coming Saturday, we are passing the peace at the Isaacs Homes, Homes Towers. Uh, that is located on 91st Street and 1st Avenue. So if you are available, come serve food and deliver it to our neighbors there at the Isaacs Houses and Homes Towers. It's been gr a great rhythm that we've had every month. So if you're a first comer, please come. And if you've come, please come again this Saturday from 1 to 2. Also, if you love to sing, if you're good at singing, or if you just know that singing is good for your soul, please join with our East Side Choir. There are upcoming opportunities to sing together. Roz, who's in the back and cheering, is excited to join you. So please email Roz and get signed up for that. 
And now there's a one final special announcement that Bruce Terrell will give us about the Groundwork Campaign. Hello. Uh, last Sunday I was uh, excited and deeply encouraged that um, I was able to announce that we had received $3.6 million in advance commitments from leaders in our church toward our Groundwork Campaign. Thank you for all of you who followed our leaders and uh, registered your pledges um, this past week. Today is what we're calling Commitment Sunday. That means for those of us who haven't already made a pledge, now is the time to prayerfully consider making a financial commitment. And to encourage us along those lines, uh, I'd like for you to hear from one of those leaders who made uh, one of those advanced commitments. His name is Carter Hinckley. Carter and his wife, Rim, have been around uh, Redeemer from, uh, since its earliest days. So Carter, would you come share with us? Good morning. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, I've been going to Redeemer since the beginning. Uh, like many others, I met my wife, Rim, who's over there, uh, at Redeemer, and Tim Keller actually officiated at our wedding. Tim encouraged us also to stay in New York, so we did, and we brought our kids up in New York, who are both at college right now. Uh, and we've been involved over the years in many ministries. Uh, Reb was a deaconess, I'm currently an elder. We've led home groups, we've taught Sunday school, uh, we've taught new member classes, and, and we really are grateful to serve. But all, throughout this whole time, we've really missed having a building, a church home on the east side. Um, I remember talking to a friend several months after the West Side W83 building opened up, and he said that the building had transformed his experience from being a relationship that was a once-a-week event to a seven-day-a-week experience. He said he went to a, a men's Bible study in the morning. His wife attended a mom's group later on in the day. His kids enjoyed uh, events after school, uh, and they participated in ministry meetings often in the evening. He said it was often in, he was often in the building three or four times a week and felt closer to the congregation than he ever had. So that's something that I really look forward to. Rem and I both look forward to that. Uh, I also look forward to ways that we can serve in our community right around us here. Uh, what a blessing, just as, as one example, for us to be able to maybe have a breakfast for the elderly in the neighborhood. And I also look forward to co-laboring with CTC, who, as you know, will be having a leadership center in the building. But of course, all this takes money. Uh, and our congregation has uh, been tremendously blessed by the resources raised through the 2016 RISE campaign that enabled us to buy the property at 91st and Lexington. And now through the Groundwork campaign, we can ensure that we'll open the doors with a solid financial foundation. We'll be able to reduce the amount of money that we need to borrow. We'll shift our focus from the burden of debt to being able to focus instead on ministry. So Rim and I are committed to helping lay the groundwork for this new ministry center. Uh, we see this campaign as the foundation of the future for Redeemer Eastside and a door into so many possibilities for God to work in our lives and in our community. We hope that you will join us. Thanks, Carter. Um, as I said earlier, now is the time for all of us to consider making a groundwork pledge. Uh, next Sunday, Celebration Sunday, we will be, you guessed it, celebrating the total amount the Lord has led us uh, to financially commit. So if you haven't already uh, indicated a pledge, please consider uh, doing so in the next few days. The total amount, of course, is certainly important, but equally important I believe, is the opportunity for all of us to come together as a community, to build together as a community. I want to share two quick anecdotes with you uh, from the numerous interactions I've had the privilege of having over the last several weeks with many of you. First, an interaction with a, a woman whose finances um, have suffered uh, greatly uh, during the pandemic. She made a $500 pledge. Uh, despite her financial situation. And when I thanked her, 
She said, it's my pleasure to give. I believe in what scripture teaches us, that God will provide. Second, when I thank the husband of the couple who made the $1 million commitment that I mentioned last week, his immediate response was simply and humbly to say, to God be the glory. So why do I share those responses with you? First, because they both beautifully illustrate what we've been hoping and praying would happen through this campaign. For the Holy Spirit to do the groundwork, as it were, in our hearts that would lead to God-centered responses. I give because God will provide I, and because I want him to be glorified. And secondly, they also beautifully illustrate that there is a level of involvement, I believe, for everyone at Redeemer East Side in this campaign. Imagine with me uh, for a moment, or as I think Charlie said a week or two ago, use your sanctified imaginations with me. What if several hundred of us made pledges before next Sunday? In fact, imagine if every single one of us who considers Redeemer East Side their church home made a financial commitment toward this new building. I would venture to say it could make an extraordinary difference in the life of our church. It wouldn't only enable us, as Carter mentioned, that we would be able to have significantly more available for ministry because we're having to substantially reduce what we need to borrow, but it could also transform our individual and collective engagement in the life of our church. Why? I'll tell you, because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our hearts follow our treasure. And because this is ultimately about God moving in our hearts, let's take the next few moments to silently pray and reflect. As we pray, ask God to lead you by his spirit to answer this twofold question. One, do you want me to make a financial commitment to this vision of groundwork? And two, would you please give me joy as I consider what that commitment might be? Do you want me to pledge and will you grant me joy? Let's spend the next few moments in prayer silently. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would answer our prayer. As we go from here today, we pray you would grant clarity and joy as we consider what you might be leading us to commit to in this vision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Travis Tinney will come and read our scripture for today, and Charlie Drew will bring us our sermon based on that text. A scripture reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, and Psalm 116. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. 
The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord. In your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Carter and I are not the same size. There we go. We tend in the church to read the Psalms uh, a fair amount because we find a certain resonance in them uh, to our life experience. But it is not always true that the Psalms resonate with our experience. And the reason for the occasional, if perhaps frequent, lack of resonance is that the Psalms are not just our songs. They are the songs of the people of God across cultures and across time. The most recent of them, probably Psalm 116, is 2,500 years old. <laughs> some of them are 3,000 years old, some are as old as 3,300 years. But there's another reason the Psalms don't always resonate with us when we read them. They are most profoundly the songs of Jesus, our fellow pilgrim and elder brother who suffered more deeply rejoiced more exultantly and trusted more fervently and faithfully than we have. Go to the first slide, please. In the days of his flesh, um, Hebrews chapter 5, which was just read to us, uh, tells us, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from, from death and he was heard because of his godly fear, his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, I don't know whether you've ever stumbled over that passage and wondered about it. Um, such a statement, in some ways, is hard to believe. It's certainly portions of it are hard to believe. Did Jesus really have to learn anything? Did Jesus have to learn obedience? Oh, come on. I mean, he was the son of God, after all. And did he really ever grow so distressed that he burst out with loud cries and tears? It's easier, perhaps, to believe in the divinity of Christ than to believe in this kind of stuff. And this is so because of the little heretic living deep down in us that won't believe in the incarnation. We don't really believe it. We won't believe, we can't believe that God loves us so much that he really chose fully to share our story with us, to share our, our broken and troubled story in order to lift us out of it. Or perhaps, perhaps, we're too proud. We won't believe that we are so far beyond fixing ourselves that nothing short of God's full identification with us in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our sin and failure could ever redeem our situation. Well, this is this, the, the, the fact that this little heretic is sort of pushing against a, a, a robust belief in the incarnation is why we need to read the Psalms. At least it's one of the reasons why we need to read the Psalms. They help us to believe that God has joined us here by giving us a window into what it felt like for him to do it, to be fully human. 
within our experience. Over the next few weeks, we'll spend time in the Psalms listening certainly for our own voices. We're going to listen for our own voice in Psalm 116, but also listen for the voice of Jesus uh, as, as well. Uh, today, we're going to look at Psalm 116. Interestingly, one of a group of Psalms called the Egyptian Hallel, which Jesus likely sang with his disciples in the upper room in the night uh, before he died. So let me move to Psalm 116 with that way of an introduction to the whole series that we're in the midst of, or we have begin our beginning. A half dozen summers or so ago, I had a health scare. I left for three weeks vacation knowing I had a large growth on my left kidney, but not knowing what it was. At one point, as I was playing in a pool with my granddaughter, Avi, I became troubled, not knowing how many more times like this, which were, were so wonderful, I was going to be able to enjoy with her. When upon our return and a diagnostic test, I learned that I had a benign cyst, large but benign. I felt something, when I learned that, I felt something of the force of verse 8 in our psalm, for you have delivered my soul, me. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Well, Psalm 116 is a thank, thanksgiving psalm. It's, we're almost at Thanksgiving, so it's appropriate that we're looking at it. It helps us to process the deliverances of life, the big ones and the little one. First of all, it tells us to be grateful people, to practice verbalizing gratitude. And then secondly, it pushes us to look past temporary deliverances to something much greater. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the first part um, uh, uh, in processing our, um, I guess, uh, one more after that. I'm sorry, I didn't give you the direct, yeah, be thankful. Here we go. Um, verse 16, oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant. He's so thankful. He's so grateful. He says he's God's servant twice. I'm your slave. I'm your slave. You know, I mean, I am so grateful glad and thankful to you for what you've done for me. I'm your servant. I'm your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, what is that telling us? It's telling us that deliverances, reprieves, they never just happen. They aren't sort of chance occurrences. They come from God, and we need to train our hearts and in some ways, especially, we need to train our voices to acknowledge them, to articulate them, to flag them, to give thanks to him for them. Now, how do we do this? Next slide, please. Um, first of all, we talk to ourselves. The Psalms often, the psalmist in the Psalms often talks to himself. It's very, very interesting, not just to God. Verse 7, return, O my soul, to your rest. The New English Bible says, be at rest once more, O oh my heart. He's talking to his heart. He's talking to himself. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Now, what does that tell us? It, it tells us that being thankful to God does not actually come naturally to us, at least not in a steady way. Uh, we may burst into delirious joy at a happy reprieve, but it may not be directed to God at all. And even if it is, our praise often quickly fades. We have to keep talking ourselves into the practice of thanksgiving. So return, O oh my soul, to your rest. Go back. Note once more who your resting place is. All the good stuff that's come to you, all the reprieves that have come to the person who is your resting place, who is your true home, and you need to acknowledge him for that. I try, by way of my own practice, uh, to devote one devotional time every week, usually Monday mornings, to handwritten prayers of thanks. I usually start with the obvious, thank you, Father, for another week of life, another week of health, uh, for food and work and help in the face of that particular temptation and I itemize it, or that particular difficulty and I itemize that. For those particular people, I name them as I write uh, in my journal whom I got to love this week. And as I do this, as I enter into this discipline of writing out what I'm thankful for to God, I let the prayer take on a life of its own. 
carrying me, um, me to fuller awareness of what God has provided and brought me through and into deeper expressions of thanks. I pause, P in our peace practices, I pause to thank and itemize uh, um, what God has done for me. But notice, and here's the main point I'm trying to make, I have to plan this. <laughs> I have to schedule this articulation of thanksgiving. I have to discipline myself to do it. I have to talk myself into the practice of thanksgiving as the psalmist does. Next slide. Another thing that I think this psalm helps us with is it's, it points out the importance that we get concrete and specific in our thanksgiving to God. God does not, never has, loved people in general. God does not love mankind in general. No, no, no. He loves you, <laughs> you know, right? He loves me in all of the particularity of my meanness, my life, my stuff, my issues, my, my struggles, my joys, all that stuff. He knows me. He loves me. He knows you. He loves you. And he wants us to get that. He wants us to understand that that's how it works. Um, and it's good and helpful to flag the ways in which he has particularly been um, good to you, kind to you and to me. Now, we don't know precisely what the psalmist had been up against, the psalmist in Psalm 116. But we can tell that it had been something, that he, that he had something specific in mind, and in his case, it had been severe. It was a pretty severe problem. He'd been boxed in with no place to turn, certain death or terrible shame staring him in the face. Verse 3, the snares of death encompassed me. Jerusalem Bible says death cords were tightening around me. You ever have that sort of, this thing is tightening around me. Maybe it's even giving me a heart attack. It's that bad. It's, the death cords were tightening around me. Verse, uh, verse 3, he had suffered distress and anguish. He speaks of the distress and anguish he had suffered so great that he had wept and stumbled. Verse 8, his sense of being assailed had been so severe that his faith had nearly been eclipsed by paranoia, which is why he burst out at one point, all men are liars! You know, he was, he'd been so hurt by people that he, that he decided to just shout, all men everywhere are liars. That's the kind of world that I live in. Uh, we don't know what it was, as I said. Uh, perhaps David, uh, David was, uh, was uh, responding to his experience of being hounded as a young man who had already been anointed by God to be the king of Israel, but he was hounded by Saul, hounded to almost to death, as, and as an older man by his own son, Absalom, unable to walk openly in the land of the living, shut out from his homeland. He couldn't walk in the land of the living. He had to hide shut out from his friends, shout out, shut out from his family and calling. Uh, we may not have been spared such extreme torment, but we have likely tasted something of it. Internet bullying, a close shave with death. I had a heart attack three years ago, necessitating triple bypass open heart surgery. A deep sense of isolation in church. Sometimes church is the loneliest place in the world. And, that, and it hurts so much because you know it shouldn't be, but it is. You're cut off from the land of the living. It might be racist exclusion or sexual abuse or anxiety so severe that it shuts us down or despair so extreme that we want to die. We all have our different stories to tell. And the point is, the point I'm trying to make at this point, is to recall them in their particularity and to take note that we are here now, that we have survived the shame and embarrassment or are surviving them, however stumblingly, because of God. Because God 
Whether we knew him or not at the time, whether we thanked him or not at the time, brought us through them to a new day. And so we're telling him about what he did. He has wiped away my tears. Verse 8, usually often through the kindness of other people. Um, He has loosed my bonds, verse 16. He has freed me from shame or the grip of it. I was brought low, verse 6, and God raised me up. He has enabled us to, or me to breathe freely again, to walk again in the land of the living, verse 9. He has, in fact, done much more than we usually have the eyes to see. Let me give you an example. Think about the water that you drink out of the faucet in New York. And then think about the water that people in Flint, Flint, Michigan drink out of the faucet. We have some of the cleanest water on the planet. And we get it day after day after day after day. Our economy is not all that it should be. Our healthcare system is not all that it should be. Our economic stability is not all that it should be. But I gotta tell you, compared to the economic stability and the healthcare system for so many other people in the rest of the world, we're, we're living high off the hog. <laughs> yeah, there's stuff that has to be fixed. God has dealt bountifully with us. And we need, we get to tell ourselves and to tell him and to tell others about it. We get to pay our joyous vows to the Lord in the presence of one another in the presence of his people, not just to ourselves, but in one another's presence, uh, verse 14. Now, next slide. Uh, There is something remarkable about entering upon the discipline that I'm encouraging us all to enter upon or continue in. Something remarkable about it. Something remarkable that happens to us when we make a practice of recalling and celebrating God's kindness to us in all of its specificity. What happens is our awareness of his kindness grows as we flag it, as we itemize it. And with that, so do our joy and hope. We find ourselves entering the life, entering into the very heartbeat of this psalm. I love, verse 1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Notice how this happens in all of our relationships, not just in our relationship to God, but in our relationships to each other. I appreciate and enjoy my wife, Jeannie, and others more as I speak highly of them, as I acknowledge them, and as I thank them. And by contrast, I appreciate and enjoy them less when I am silent about them or to them or speak poorly of them. And this is an especially important discipline with people because with people, there are inevitably unpleasant things. And the more we report them to them, as well as to ourselves, the larger they loom in our own minds and the less we like them. (laughs) The less happy life is with them. Because the stuff that we're zeroing in on tends to eclipse everything else. You've seen that happen. We've all seen it happen in relationships to people. Well, with God, I said this happens with people. Well, with God, of course, there's nothing evil to report, but there is much that we do not yet understand about what he's doing, right? There's stuff that goes on in your life that you cannot get, you don't get. Why is he doing this to me? This is exceedingly unpleasant. This is really not right. It's not what a child of God ought to be having in his or her life experience, so we think. So God's ways are inscrutable. We can't understand. There are hard things, and they can loom larger and larger if we dwell on them, eclipsing the ever-present and ample testimony of his, ban- of his bounty, which is constantly there. His mercies, Lamentations 3, I quoted this last, a couple weeks ago, his mercies are new every morning. His mercies were new this morning for you. 
if you could just flag them. And that's the trick. We just need to flag them and thank him for them and tell one another about them, rehearse them, so that they get into our consciousness, so that it get into our brain and push against all those little voices that are saying, God hates you. God is indifferent to you. All this terrible stuff that's happening to you, it's happening because he wants to hurt you. He's in the business of finding out what you love so that he can take it away and make you miserable. So that's a lie. That's not how God works. And we need to rehearse the good stuff so that we remember that. The cynic in us, let me just press this a little bit and drill down on it a bit. The cynic in each of us chooses. There's a, there's a cynic in each of us. And that cynic makes choices. The cynic in your heart and mine chooses uh, not to see the bounty of God or to see through it uh, to something sinister or to something indifferent. Oh, he's, he's given me this good thing now because you know any minute now the, shoe, the shoe's gonna drop. Something's gonna happen. He's just setting me up for a real, real hurt, a real, real disappointment. There's cynic in us that keeps waiting for that kind of terrible thing to happen. We, the, the cynic in us, for example, refuses to see God's beauty in the soaring beauty of an eagle and sees only a sophisticated killing machine hunting for food. But to do this sort of thing with our experience in life is to choose partial blindness. I'm not denying that there's bad stuff out there. No, I'm not denying that. But, but when we zero in on that stuff alone, we are choosing partial blindness to miss out on the ready and ever-present evidence of God's goodness. It runs contrary, make that sort of choice, runs contrary to the determined cry in Psalm 116, I will, this is my choice, I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will do it, and I will keep on doing it. So thanksgiving is coming, write him a prayer. <laughs> write him a long prayer. Make sure you have an hour <laughs> and start to list just last week. Get concrete, get specific. Do it. It'll encourage you. It'll really encourage you and encourages me. Now, next slide. Um, I want to push past. This is fine, what I just told you, as far as it goes, but it maybe doesn't go far enough. And here's what I mean. There's a shadow that hovers over Psalm 116, and you may have already started to think about that shadow in the light of what's happening in your life or has happened in your life, has happened to someone you love. It's hinted at in the reference to death in verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The psalm describes only one sort of deliverance, it describes only temporary deliverance. The psalmist is able to tell his happy story, but only because he lived to tell it. The psalmist is now dead, by the way. He died about 2,500 years ago. He's not around to tell you any more stories about how God has been good to him. He's gone. Now, I can report that God saved me from my heart attack but only because I didn't die. How many people do you know who had a heart attack and did die? And they're not around to tell you about the deliverance of God. One day, there'll be no more reports from me. The reprieve from cancer doesn't always come. And think about this. Deliverance from shame, fear, and stumbling did not come to our Lord Jesus. His whole world fell apart fell apart at the end. So, does the cynic in us win after all? Is Psalm 116 a false hope, a comforting, foolish song that we sing as the ship goes down, as it eventually will for all of us? My ship's going to go down. Roz, your ship's going to go down. Every Sorry, I don't mean to pick on you, but, eh, eh, you know, uh, <laughs> Carter, your ship's going to go down. You know, we're, you know, all of our ships, and we don't know when. It might be next week. You know, I'm, I'm getting there, you know. I'm, I'm 71, you know. I, I know I look 21, but I'm 71. And, you know, it, you know, it's coming. 
So, so what is this song? Isn't this a joke? Come on. Let's face things the way they really are. Stop this silly nonsense of wishful thinking, whistling in the dark. No, there is deep hope embedded in this psalm. I don't want to leave you in despair here. There is deep hope embedded in this psalm, um, and that hope begins to rise in us when we remember what I started the sermon telling you. That Psalm 116 is Jesus. Jesus sang this psalm on the night of his betrayal. Jesus sang this psalm. When he said, I, he was referring to himself. He was talking about his own life, his own experience. Psalm 116, when we realize that, that Psalm 116 is Jesus' song as well as ours, when in particular we imagine Jesus singing these words on Easter morning. Hope rises. I mean, listen to Jesus. The snare of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Garden of Gethsemane. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Verse 8. You have delivered my soul from death. You have delivered my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living forever. I'm arisen from the dead. I'm never going to die again. Jesus' story eternalizes Psalm 116. It eternalizes it. It takes it out of the temporary, the merely temporary, the enormous and game-changing uh, uh, difference between the psalmist and you and me saying these words after a temporary reprieve and Jesus saying them on Easter morning is that in Jesus' case, deliverance comes, but only on the far side of a horrible death. It is delayed, but it comes. It's delayed until after death, but then it comes. And when it comes, it absolutely annihilates death itself. It destroys death. That's pretty cool. It isn't temporary. It's permanent. The cords that bound Jesus at his arrest, verse 16, his distress and anguish uh, in Gethsemane, verse 3, the liars who condemned him, verse 11. You see, Jesus' story is right here in our passage. It's right here in the psalm, down to the specific phrases, the stumbling under the load of the cross, his shame as he hung naked on the cross. These were all real and particularly horrific because he was innocent, and yet there was no deliverance from them in his life, in this life. Jesus was dragged down into Sheol, verse 3. Jesus perished. Jesus died, bound, hated by men, and cursed by God. That's what happened. But then he rose. He walks now. Once more in the land of the living, death could not hold him because unlike us, he died innocent. The innocent for the guilty. His death was precious. His death was infinitely precious in the eyes of his father. His death was noted by his father. If you think for a moment that his death was easy on the father, you don't understand. It was as hard on the father as it was on the son. And Jesus' faithful obedience, even unto death, was noted by his Father. It was loved by his Father. It was precious to his Father. And, 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 it was, and he was vindicated by his Father. And it has, with great tenderness, been applied to you and to me because of our union with the Son, because we belong to the Son. What the Son has gone through, he has brought us with him through. And his resurrection on the far side is the promise of ours. Next slide, please. Our hope takes on an added dimension when we imagine Jesus telling us of God's deliverance in the courts of the Lord, in the courts of Jerusalem, verse 19. He says in verse 18, I will pay my, I hear Jesus saying these words, I'm going to pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all my people, in the presence of all my people, all my brothers and sisters, all those dear ones for whom I died. For this can only mean that we will be there with him 
when he, do, when he does, not just here, but there in the new eternal order of things, the place of his triumph where every lie and oppression, every sin and sickness have been annihilated. How can this be true? Because Jesus, our fellow pilgrim, our brother, who has passed through death bearing our sins and death on his own shoulders, will bring us there with him. He's the good shepherd who comes home rejoicing with his sheep on his shoulders, right into the courts of God, right into the home of God. He carries us. He brings us. You are there if you're in Christ right now. You're in the presence of the Father's love. You are home. Huh. We've still got, you know, we're not fully home already, but not yet. I know all that stuff. Okay. But we are home now. Because Jesus is home. Never forget that the sufferings of Psalm 116 didn't just happen to Jesus the way they may seem to just happen to us. He reached out towards them and he took them on when he came to live among us as one of us and to die with us. Because he came to recapitulate our lives. He came to recapitulate. He came as the second Adam, to do Adam all over again, but much better. <laughs> he came to recapitulate our lives, our trials, our pains, our stumblings, our humiliations, our death, with the enormous difference that he never broke faith with God. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And by his innocent suffering, he has carried us and will carry us through ours, even those sufferings uh, which are deserved. Next slide, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and then we'll be done. I find perhaps the most moving thing about verse 18, when we hear Jesus speaking it, is the joy that we hear in it. The joy. Imagine, again, think, Jesus saying these words. He says, I will pay my bill. God, I'm looking forward to this. There's something I'm really looking forward to do. I'm really looking forward to this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the presence of you and me. There's joyful anticipation here. You see, Jesus isn't a bouncer. We sometimes think of him as a bouncer. You know, he's standing on the outskirts of heaven and sort of begrudgingly maybe letting us in. <laughs> he's not a bouncer. He's there with his arms wide open saying, come in. I, come on in. I have brought you in so you can come. I want you with me. You know, a lot of times we think that the best we get from him is forgiveness. That's not the best you get from him. You get desire from him. You get his desire for you, his delight in you, his delight in your... God is that way. I really have to end, but just think about that. Think about that as you, as you pen your thanksgivings. Think about the fact that God wants to be with you. You know, I might have died during my heart attack, my heart surgery. I might well have. And if I had, it would have grieved the Lord to see the grief of my family. There's no question about that. But it would be, at the same time, it would have been precious to him. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I'm one of his saints. Um, for it would have brought me home. It would have brought me home to him and the Father where he wants me to be seeing his glory, enjoying his love, enjoying his presence in the company of the rest of God's people. All right, next slide, and then I'm done. Um, uh, every deliverance is a picture. And th this is maybe a summary statement of what I'm trying to say. Um, what we've been getting at is this. Every story of deliverance in your life and my life, however grand, however small, Every new day that dawns, every close call that you get past, every I forgive you from someone you've offended, my CT scan at the end of a scary summer, every one of these reprieves has become something beyond itself. Every single reprieve has become a picture. It's become a promise. It's become a guarantee of the end of all suffering, the end of all tears, of all loss, of all sickness and pain, all guilt and all isolation, all shame and stumbling, and of death itself. For God has entered our story and has sung our song alongside us. And he has owned Psalm 116 as his own, and he's lifted us out of our story and into his. Now this story, I just have to say, is too astonishing to have been made up. 
It's too good, too amazing not to be true. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the wonder of your engagement with us that was so full and remains that way. Bless you. Help us to be more thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. One way that we express our thanks, our joy, and even the fact that we, uh, our thanks and joy is part of something eternal is by giving, giving our whole lives to God and even giving our gifts to God. So during this time of offertory, you have an opportunity to reflect, what is my thanks and how do I want to give to God? And you also have an opportunity to give financially on the screens. There'll be a way to give there. You can also pray about your gift to groundwork.
Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. A few announcements as we finish up. If you have anything that you would like to pray with someone with about, there are deacons and deaconesses who are trained leaders that will be standing right here to the right of the stage after the service is over. Please seek them out. And if you're joining us online, please call the CARE helpline. 
and someone will be able to get back with you. And if you have questions about the Christian faith and you'd like to process with someone, there'll also be someone to the left of the stage that you can uh, talk with and they'll listen with you. And now let's lift our heads for the benediction. Receive God's good word. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs>